Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, sorry, Norman, it's Vicky's time to shine as we kick off the first in our series on the films A Star is Born. Before you lies the most glamorous city on Earth, Hollywood, California, a city where men and women skyrocket to fame or plunge to oblivion. What happens amid the glamour of such famous gathering places as the Ambassador Pool? The Trocadero on the Gold Coast of the film city. At the Brown Derby, where famous stars meet. Or in the gay setting of Santa Anita Park. It's all a part of fantastic Hollywood. Hollywood at playtime. Here behind the walls of Selznick International Studio, we see Hollywood at work. A new Janet Gaynor is in the making. A Janet Gaynor never before seen on the screen. Co-starring is Frederick March. More likable, more swashbuckling than ever before. A Star is Born, Andy. Now, I don't remember. I know that we got waylaid when I snuck a whole bunch of uh, uh, Rocky movies into our, our script. But did we really intend on putting A Star is Born, the whole thing? Was that our original intention or did we latch on to the remake, last year's remake? And, and is that what got us to do it? I can't remember why we decided to do this series. This is a series we had talked about 
um, kind of way back, right? It, it's been a while. This is something we thought was an interesting idea because we're like, oh, this is, you know, they've made this three times. Let's talk about it. And then mm-hmm. I think it was one of those things where we got wind of the fact that that Bradley Cooper was redoing it. And we're like, oh, well, let's hold off and save it up for when that new version's out. Yeah. And it's just been something we've kind of had on the back burner, knowing eventually we'd get around to it. And and here we are. Well, we we are here indeed. And uh, the last week we talked a little bit about the fact that this is, you know, we're doing the films A Star is Born, but it, it actually is based uh, uh, even earlier than that on a, a film called What's What Price Hollywood. I have not been able to watch that, but I see from your letterbox that you were. I did. I did. Yes, indeed. I hope that 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 comes into it. And it gets to this question, which now after seeing the 1937 version, I have to ask and and say the words out loud. Why is this story (laughs) so important that they have to make it even under the same name? I don't. I just I don't. I well, I think it's it's a really interesting one, and it's going to be fun for us to explore this 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 whole notion of what is this story saying? What yeah. is it that people connect to with this tale of of following your dreams and the rise and fall from uh, from celebrity and you know, just kind of the the, the whirlwind of of uh, uh, you know the life of being somebody who's kind of in this creative element and everything and right and really kind of how it affects people it's definitely a property that has uh, found a connection and i think probably it finds a connection in the circles of uh, actors and directors and writers in hollywood because it's something that they see and they are very connected with it's you know they see people that maybe even themselves who have these same story arcs within their mm-hmm. own lives of the rise and fall of the career and how hard it is and how how exciting it is when you get those breaks and how crushing it can be when all of a sudden you kind of uh, wane in popularity and i mean it's it's I, I think it's just a natural story that fits in anybody's life really i think you could easily take this outside of uh, kind of just the hollywood system and look at how uh, people's lives shift and change and and they go from being the top dog at the office to all of a sudden you know a guy who's not that nobody's excited by anymore because now there's this fresh new blood i think it's a a tale of age and of how people kind of go through life and it's you know to that end i think it is a story that just pretty much everybody can find a way to connect to. It doesn't have to just be people who are uh, in the world of celebrity. Well, and this is something I think is really interesting that this film uh, and and my curiosity is, and I have not seen all four of them, uh, but my grand curiosity here is, um, you know, how well does this film uh, and, and does this story as it's told over the decades uh, attach itself to contemporary cultural you know, roles like gender roles. This movie is very much about dramatic changing gender roles in, between this couple. And and I think a, a strong case could be made that the, the ultimate end of the movie comes to Norman, not because he was, um, you know, his world was up, was turned over in his career was turned over, but because his world at home was turned over and he didn't know what to do with the, his relationship with this woman when he was the man. And um, and 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 so I, I think it's a, an interesting story to be told uh, in the way this man and woman relate to one another as culture sort of changes around him, around them. And that that's honestly the thing that I was I found myself more interested in than his, you know, failing story as a, you know, an actor. It's uh, I think no matter how you slice it, it's going to be an element of that is going to be something that affects the tragedy at the end of the story, right? Mm -hmm. It's Mm going to be the alcoholism. It's going to be that change in who they are. They're no longer the star. They are kind of this, this figure who doesn't necessarily have that place anymore. And what do they do when they all of a sudden enter this, this position in their life where they are kind of no longer the breadwinner, but the one at home answering the phone and taking messages and and no longer recognized. 
I think that is uh, a very interesting element. And you're right. I think that that probably fits in with this one very strongly from 1937 because of the time. Mm -hmm. And it will be something really interesting to see as we look at 1954s and 1976s and, and the 2018 version and, and definitely see kind of what the, what the, uh, the changing vibe in that element um, how it shifts because that period too the 30s the 50s the 70s uh all of these are representative of grand sociocultural changes and and sort of transition when you look back at sort of the history of um you know of of both women's rights and women's roles um you know i think that's a i think that's a really fascinating lens through which to to look at these what was changing at the time um that that forced Norman's hand as our representative character of the the man um to to take his own life that he was not strong enough to to withstand. Yeah, it's uh and there's definitely kind of an interesting uh comparison I think to be made between What Price Hollywood and this film in that sense because they are the closest in uh in production 1932 is when what price hollywood was made and oh, 1937 right. so only a few years later it is very much the same story and so to that end i i find it very similar in in a lot of those aspects to this i mean there's there's definitely still differences about how that film uh shifts and and who these characters are and everything and i don't get quite as much a sense of that that position of loss that um, that the character has in that case, it's Max, who um, he's actually not even married to uh, to in that case, it's Mary. Um, he, she's married to a totally different person. And um, but he's it's really in that particular case, it really is just kind of this self pity and just kind of uh, He's just no longer interested in kind of who he's become. And in that film, it is very much he doesn't like it anymore, who he's become, and he shoots himself. And so mm. it's it's a very different shift that I think makes for a more complex and more interesting story when you look at what's happening in this 1937 film. Well, let's let's just talk a little bit about the the comparative sort of climaxes here and this the one you're describing he shoots himself at the end and the one that we're talking about here he takes off his robe and his sandals and he walks out into the ocean into the sunset and swims out into the deep um, and drowns himself um, what is your sense of the relative impact of those two ends uh, did did one strike you as as more heart-wrenching than the other I, I think you know the idea of shooting shooting himself seems like an extraordinarily violent um, way to go in 1932 uh, in a story like this. But, you know, I don't know, having not seen it. it. It definitely is. I mean, it's it's a very violent way to kind of take yourself out. And also he's drunk again. And so it, in that end, it kind of becomes this sense of his head's not screwed on right. He's drunk as usual, and he just makes this brash decision and goes for it. It's 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 painful. It's dark. It's a you know creates kind of the the you know just a bloody mess. But it's um it's just a very violent and abrupt end. What I found about the end in this film in the 1937 A Star Is Born, when when Norman makes that decision to uh, to swim out into the water. It was a very conscious, uh, kind of thought out decision, and it was so much more tragic because this was a, a a a big decision to make, and it wasn't a decision that is is made at the you know the drop of a the, whatever the expression is drop of a needle drop of a pin <laughs> drop of drop a hat of, <laughs> drop of a hat what are you dropping <laughs> no, I don't know what you drop a piano a piano drop of a drop piano, piano drop a building head. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but no, it, uh, but you're exactly right. That premeditation uh, adds another layer of of drama and that sort of emotional connection and for us and yeah. tragedy. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I actually uh, that sort of baffles me that he would be, um, you know, he would do it in in a state of just sort of rage. And you know, the one of the things that's so great, I think, about the end of this movie is that he's not drunk. 
when he does it. He's, yeah. you know, he's he has his wits about him and he makes a decision and has a moment of exchange with her where he's he gets to to say that, you know, he loves her. It's very sad. And all of that builds to an incredibly, incredibly tragic ending. So much more mm -hmm. tragic uh, for, in my mind than in What Price Hollywood, which it, again, he's drunk. It's a quick decision. He makes that decision. Maybe a few seconds later, he wouldn't have made that decision, but he makes it. And because we see Norman you know, take his clothes off and wade out into the water and just swim out. You know what's happening. And it's a it's a hard decision to swim out into the ocean and drown yourself. That's not mm -hmm. something that you do lightly. And it certainly is a decision that could very easily um, you could change your mind quickly and then just swim back to the shore. I mean, he obviously stays out there and forces himself to drown. And it's it's horrible and it's tragic. And it it is so much more heartbreaking the way that it works in the context of this film. Plus, the fact that they're married, I think, lends a lot to that relationship that we didn't get in the previous film because she's with a, a different person. And the way that we have this relationship that's been building over the course of the film and creating this strength, and he's he's excited about her uh, her career growth, but also as at this loss. And there's nothing more painful than in this film when he goes to the tracks and he's drinking ginger ale and the media guy is just a jerk as usual, tells him how he feels, and that pushes uh, Norman over the edge back into drinking. It was just awful to see that happen when I felt like, you know, he's he's found a way through this. So that's the that's the big climax for our main character, Norman, who, you know, he has some issues with the ocean. <laughs> what do you make of the bit after that? We get a sequence after that. We have a funeral sequence and then we have a sequence in, um, you know, the, the award ceremony. What is your sense of how this movie ends after the, the way he takes his life? Well, there's a few elements. Uh, first off, we we have the um, uh, the funeral, which is just awful. It's an awful creation of how people react to fame, even in times of great hardship. Mm -hmm. And watching these these mobbing fans, how they're uh, treating Esther, aka Vicky, uh, it's just it's painful to see the way that people are treating her and in her time of grief it was awful um so that's the first part the second part she decides she's quitting and she's packing up her house and she's moving home this is i, I get a little frustrated here because at the beginning of the film it's never really explained her family situation but she's living with her aunt and un uncle and her grandma her grandma talks to her and uh and kind of convinces her that it's okay to follow your dreams and all this after the the 1930s shock at when her aunt and uncle react to her uh granny says it's okay here's some money follow your dreams that's what i did and you should do the same and then the family is virtually dropped from the film and that frustrated me and um i mean there's one moment where she's writing a letter to her grandma and that's it. But it's they're completely dropped. And so it's a little frustrating for me because all of a sudden grandma is brought in again. She shows up to kind of give her a pep talk and and all of that. Um, I, I struggled with that because I didn't I, I felt at that point it was really a deus ex machina to bring granny back just to uh, help turn her around. That frustrated me. And I felt like it could have been stronger if granny had kind of continued through the story more and i mean i like the final end i like when esther you know she she's back and she's now she's decided to stay in the business and she's at her next premiere and when she introduces herself i thought that was really touching the way she says hello everybody this is mrs norman main as a way to kind of yeah connect herself to him but the whole grandma thing was it was it was very frustrating for me I could not agree with you more. And I have to tell you, I'm relieved that you take that that uh, angle with the end because I found myself really frustrated. What it demonstrated for me is that the writers didn't feel like Esther herself had enough agency after what we've been through with her rise to fame and the fall of her marriage and her husband's death, that she did not have enough agency or experience to demonstrate through performance and language that she could make her own 
um, decision about whether or not to stay in show business and make that real. I think we do need her to stay in show business. I don't think we needed Granny uh, Granny's wisdom to do it. And I don't think Granny's time at the mic was funny or cute after, at the end of this movie. I think that it it is, for me, one of the things that really dates this movie in particular that makes it something that doesn't stand up to the test of time, that it feels like a 1930s sort of we're going to end on this charming note, um, you know, and, and pretend you didn't see what you just saw um, because everybody has to be happy. And um, that's that's kind of what I was left with. I, I felt like I didn't really trust the movie at that point. Yeah, and it's it's frustrating, and I get it. It's it's thirties. It's it's how they were kind of structuring the films at the time. But I, I feel like, um, well, I, I guess it'll be interesting to see how this element of the story continues over the rest of the the these. I guess I can't call it a franchise, but yeah. the, these films as we watch them to see how kind of the family relationships and the family connections with our characters carry through. Before and after the uh, the suicide. Well, uh, you Andy, know, I'll, it, it I'll occurs really to me to see. that this may be the first point on our list of points that allows us to say, yes, this movie should be remade. Yeah, absolutely. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Maybe these are the kinds of things we should be keeping score of. Well, definitely. I, I, I think there are big moments. And I, I think that's something that's actually really interesting to look at. Like, what is it about this film that stands out and says, oh, this would be great. Let's, you know, this will be fun to to play this out in this era, in the 50s, in the mm-hmm. 70s. Um, and I think certainly the Oscars bit. I mean, that's a, a really exciting bit to kind of see in 1937 is how they were doing the Oscars. Um, I and, and then having that chance of of having him kind of stumble in. Uh, and do his drunk tirade. Mm-hmm. So that'll be something that will will. Uh, I I've only seen the the most recent one, and this one. So you know the the interesting elements that I can compare at this point are only from those two. Right. But there's certainly that, and I think also the family element. I think uh, by the time we get to talk about the 2018 one, we're going to see an interesting family element, not hers but his, that does kind of allow for some of that connection at the at the end. So I'm yeah. excited to kind of look at look at how that develops. And honestly, I mean, there are probably other elements, and I think we'll just have to kind of as we get into the subsequent films, go, oh, and then you can see where this was getting pulled from and where that's getting pulled from. Oh, and something else that they they repeat is the whole idea of I just wanted to take another look at you. That whole that yeah. whole bit. The movie's called A Star is Born, but the original play was it happened in or the original screenplay titles it happened in Hollywood. Maybe too close uh, a connection to uh what price Hollywood? That's possible. It really is. Uh, I I think that there are uh, well even even that film, the original title of that one was The Truth About Hollywood. So it's interesting that uh, that that kind of keeps kind of popping up as an element of the title. And mm-hmm. that film was based on a story by Adela Rogers St. John's, who had based it uh, very loosely on the plot of an actress, Colleen Moore, and her husband, who is an alcoholic, John McCormick. Um, uh, as well as the life and death of uh, director Tom Foreman, who did commit suicide after he had a nervous breakdown. So after pulling kind of from those uh, people's life stories, she wrote the um, uh, kind of this story that became What Price Hollywood. Now, there was such similarity with these two films that when and, and actually uh, David O. Selznick, who produced this, he actually asked George Cukor, who actually had directed What Price Hollywood, if he would direct A Star is Born. And Cukor said, well, the plot's way too similar to what I just did. So he passed it up. And then RKO that had produced it, they actually uh, considered filing a plagiarism suit against David O. Selznick and his company because the stories were so close. Now, for whatever reason, and I, I feel like this... There's some Hollywood backdoor dealings, um, but they chose not to take legal action. I'm really curious what led to that. I just don't yeah. know. Um, but um, interestingly enough, I guess George Cukor didn't have uh, that many issues because he actually is the one who did come back to direct the 1954 version. <laughs> so. It just turns out he wasn't done. Uh, right. He just wasn't done. It is 
is what price Hollywood? Uh, that one is still, is that, is that out in the public domain? It's not. It's not in the public domain. It's um, it's a trickier one to get access to. I think um, Warner Brothers has has uh, has it now, and the only way you can get it is to actually get it through the Warner Archives collection. Okay, because this one so, did fall into the public domain, and you can find right. it in a number of handy places uh, that you might go find uh, moving picture projects, wherever you might you like know, to do that. And that being said, it's it's a relatively kind of messy looking. Uh, you can find some messy looking prints, but yeah. I, I can't I can't remember who released the the uh, Blu-ray. But there's a really gorgeous looking Blu-ray out there that um, I want to say Kino Lorber. Yeah, Kino Lorber released it in 2012, and they cleaned it up. And man, the Technicolor just pops. It's just a beautiful looking film. Oh and, no, Andy! Uh, I watched it on Amazon, and I have so many complaints. <laughs> I should have gone to Kino Lorber. <laughs> Kino Lorber. I watched it on Amazon as well. I didn't watch the Blu-ray, but I oh. scrolled through um, screen grabs of all the images from it, and I'm like, oh yeah, I can see why I, uh, that would be one worth picking up just to just to see those crisp images. But uh, that's what happens when things fall into. Uh, into uh, public, domain. public domain, yeah. yeah. Although it's interesting, they, um, I, I think Warner Brothers ended up with it again after because David O. Selznick had it. Um, uh, when his company dissolved, it fell to one of the financiers who sold it to Film Classics, um, and then they uh, sold it to uh, a producer who was going to remake it. But he sold it uh, to Warner Brothers, who. Um, then that's right before they did the remake. And so that kind of, I think that, that uh, journey led to the remake. And then when the public, when the um, uh, right to renew the copyright came up, they did not do it for some reason. I don't understand why. And so technically this fell into, into uh, the public domain, but the property itself still is held by Warner Brothers somehow. I don't know how that works, but Warner Brothers has exclusive rights to the property, just not the film. And they can, I guess, keep churning out movies every 42 years. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, however long it's going to be. Right. Uh, okay. Let, let's just run through your kind of hot list of fun highlights from this movie. Things that you like. What What do you really appreciate about this movie? Um, there's a lot of stuff that I appreciate. I love the I the, this world of the 30s when, uh, you know, when your niece is acting crazy and you want you say, oh, I would just I'm gonna dose her with sulfur and molasses. <laughs> you know, those those are the good old days. Good the, old um, days. Yeah. No. It's you know the, there's a lot of stuff about it that actually uh, just it's it has some nice moments from the time like when she goes to find the apartment and it's like six bucks a week and it says no cowboys which is right. you know, just kind of funny to see it's like uh you know the the interesting reasoning for that i'd love to kind of get a sense of um the way it ties itself into reality with uh her trip to the uh, hollywood to Grauman's chinese theater and the hollywood walk of fame and, and looking at all the the real uh, footprints and everything and then obviously norman Maine's kind of thrown in there which was a lot of fun to just kind of see how they tied that together um the, i i love the little nod to hollywood renaming people and yeah uh, that was that a wonderful actually, sequence too watching how they figured out her name just running through right. things that rhyme with her name but sound better <laughs> Right. <laughs> and and then I love that you find out that he actually like Norman Maine isn't his name either. Yeah. It's Alfred Henkel. And what a fun little uh, thing that is, which is an interesting one, because I think that that actually uh, is something having to do with his own name, because Frederick March, his actual name is Ernest Frederick McIntyre Bickle. And so <laughs> they they went they were kind of a little nod the the Henkel from the Bickle. And yeah. just kind of how that all changed, which I think is really funny. It's the Hinkle um, transformation. It's a right. proof. I, I love the uh, the behind the scenes world of of Hollywood and, and the first AD that we have here and just the way that he plays it just is, is I don't know, it's for me working in that world and seeing first ADs, it just cracks me up because 
uh, yeah, the whole idea of like screaming on set, you know, quiet everybody, and just the way, <laughs> <laughs> the way that. Oh, the way this guy plays it is just really funny. And uh, it's fun seeing people like like Andy Devine um, and Lionel Stander, who we've seen in places before popping up here. Um, you know, it just there's a lot of these elements that like I already mentioned the Oscars and how they were kind of doing the old Oscars. And and uh, and also I was really impressed. There were a lot of uh, moments of the cinematography that I was impressed with. We had some beautifully lit sh- scenes when um when at the beginning when granny takes esther to the train and uh the train departs the darkness kind of overtakes granny and she's left as this silhouette as she walks away it was beautiful and likewise when uh you have this moment with uh with norman when he walks esther home and uh somebody is walking by and just the way that he moves in the frame to the point where his back is almost up to the lens and you only see a sliver of him and he's he's kind of shadowing your face like there's some beautifully constructed shots and scenes so i'm just rambling I, now Lots well of stuff i I, I want to throw in the the you know the scene where we get her um, actually serving hors d'oeuvres right where she's trying to yeah. get noticed that is a lovely scene on a number of counts, not the least of which is her performance as she keeps changing it up every time she uh, goes to another group <laughs> to try. She's a di- she's taking on a different demeanor, a different accent. Uh, and uh, it's it's re- very funny. It's a wonderful sort of comedic uh, bit. But it, it's also a really wonderful entire sequence because every time she sort of connects us to a new group, we meet a new group in production, a new group of executives talking about pictures, you know moving pictures and they're they're talking about how nobody really likes norman anymore like he's just hard to deal with and so we get they they reveal for us they sort of peel back these layers of that sort of insidious gossip in this scene that i think is um is really fun and uh it's a great setup for their relationship and for his ultimate you know fall in his career and uh his poor uh you know uh what's his name his his poor uh, buddy who keeps trying to give him uh give him work and how hard it is to the fight on behalf niles. of this guy in niles right uh, yeah. uh, you know this this look at niles life as he's trying to continue to give norman work and how hard he works to do it uh even though norman's completely working against him by just being a tool yeah it's it's frustrating to see those sorts of moments but and that's something else i really loved about this like the supporting actors it was just a great group of people that we had here i just i loved all of them um i mean obviously janet gaynor and frederick march as our two leads were wonderful but adolph menju and may robin robson andy divine lionel stander Mm -hmm. uh you know just kind of it's, it's a long list of great faces from the 30s who did some just great bit parts and Adolf Menju as Niles. I think he played that character uh, just really nicely for, uh, for a producer that has weathered, you know, his time with his leading man for uh, quite a while to the point where it's, it's, you know, becoming very frustrating to kind of continue. And I I think that really plays out in Lionel standards performance, who Mm -hmm. is clearly, uh, you know, I mean, as the as the kind of the the media man, it's funny watching this film. All I could think of was uh, what was the um, uh, uh, the Coen Brothers uh, uh, Hollywood movie they just did, the Caesar um, Hail Caesar Hail, Hail Caesar, yeah, yeah, uh, and how they had that uh, that character. I mean, that film really focuses on that Josh Brolin character who basically is playing this type of guy who's cleaning exactly. up after these actors. And that was exactly what I was thinking. But man, is he the wrong guy for the job? Because Lionel Stander is just terrible. I mean, he's so, so just awful with him. I know. But, and and uh, yet he was he was really sort of my favorite of the <laughs> ancillary characters. I get great joy out of him every time he's trying to trying to craft a headline, right? Trying to create a story. And when he is typing along and asks her name and he has to he stands up in silence and stomps into Niles office and says, <laughs> have you heard her name? <laughs> I thought that was just brilliant. I, I really enjoyed his performance. That uh, was great. And we just uh, saw him recently in uh, Once Upon a Time in the West. That's right. He's good. All over Very the place. place. Uh, a, a little bit more on Janet Gaynor. I have not uh, seen enough of her. I really enjoyed her development in this film. What do you know of Janet Gaynor? What else have you seen of hers and what do you like? 
Well, my uh, the other film I've seen of hers, which I absolutely adore, is is uh, the silent film that she was in in 1927, Sunrise, the Song of Two Humans. A beautiful, beautiful film that uh, I think is just one of those films that I watched in film class uh, long ago and uh, just totally fell in love with it. It's it's I think one of my favorite silent films. It's just a beautiful romance uh, drama with some just uh, funny moments, some dark moments. And uh, she's in it. Uh, George O'Brien's in it. Margaret Livingston's in it, uh, directed by F.W. Murnau. Just it's a it's a great film, and it's uh, it was my first experience with Janet Gaynor, who I really I was looking through her film her filmography and realized I don't think I've seen anything else of hers, uh, and uh, other than this, but uh, you know, right out of the gate when uh, when she did um, Sunrise, The Song of Two Humans, and I shouldn't say out of the gate. I mean, she was acting since the earlier twenties, but uh, out of the gate as far as the Academy Awards are concerned. The first year, she won the Academy Award for Best Actress. And uh, what's interesting is at the time, it was uh, for multiple films. And it's the only she's the only actress to win an Academy Award for multiple roles. She uh, was in Seventh Heaven, Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans, and Street Angel. And so for her performance in those three films, she walked home with the Oscar. And, uh, and you know, I mean, she did great in this film. And weirdly, you're not going to see much after this because she retires a few years later. Yeah. Wow. I, I feel like the one to see is Seventh Heaven uh, and o- only because of this just little nod, the Oscar that she wins in this movie, uh, the, A Star is Born, that they actually hand her was her Oscar that she actually won for Seventh Heaven, which I think is super funny. Uh, well, and well, it's, it, for those three films. For those three films. Right, right, three, right, you're yeah. right. The, the Oscar ceremony, though, did you catch this? Uh, the the little bit of deja vu that she gets uh, at the Oscar ceremony here when Norman comes in as and, and does his drunken rant and accidentally slaps her in the face. And uh, it's mm-hmm. a, a wonderful sequence. Apparently, uh, Janet Gaynor's sister was with her at the Seventh Heaven Sunrise Street Angel Oscar ceremony and got super drunk and completely disrupted the entire thing. That's crazy. Yeah. And just imagine, like, if if social media existed at the time, uh, the stories that would be spinning around all of this. Oh, dear. But at the time, these weren't even broadcast. It was just a it was a banquet just for the people in the industry. And that was it. Those were simple so, times. Totally Andy. different. Totally different. Yeah. Yeah. Very different. Uh, it, that's uh, fascinating. I think she was terrific. And, uh, of course, uh, Frederick March, uh, as Norman made, uh, you know, for a movie like this, a story like this, I think he was just the right guy uh, for, for this performance to, to actually give us a believable transformation for him, a believable fall that ends in him swimming out into the sunset. Uh, he was the guy for me. He was so great uh, in this role. And another one I haven't seen enough of. I've seen more films of his than I had of hers. But still, I, I as I was looking through his filmography, I'm like, gosh, I should watch his Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I, yeah. I bet that would be a good one. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of like the best years of our lives. I think that's just an amazing, amazing film. Um, but even... Uh, inherit the wind that's mm-hmm. another one that that he was in that i haven't seen so another actor who has done a lot of amazing films that i definitely need to see more of because he you're right he was perfect in this role i really just loved him he was perfect and and a uh, little shout out to for patrons we just talked about well not just i guess i haven't been there in a few weeks i i remember talking recently about uh one of his films uh that you got me to watch uh which was seven days in may uh, he plays the mm-hmm. president in Seven Days in May, the um, uh, John Frankenheimer film, which was absolutely terrific. And we talked about that in one of our series uh, rundowns uh, recently on the Saturday matinee show. So um, I, he's just great. I, I really enjoy him. And he was he's such a, a wonderfully nuanced performer. And uh, the, the, you know, it was just great to watch him in this movie. Yeah, I agree. I I also just going back to the supporting actors, uh, Andy Devine is he's one of those faces that you just recognize. And I think it's funny because he's a, he's a face and we've talked about him when we talked about Stagecoach, 
uh, when we did our 1939 mm-hmm. series. But I, and I think that's really where I remember him more is he's one of those characters that popped up in Westerns a lot, like the man who shot, shot Liberty Valance and how the West was won, uh, the adventures of Wild Bill Hickok, uh, the TV series that he did. Um, um, even, I mean, he was in Robin Hood, the Disney one, he was Friar Tuck. He's got that voice and that face that for me just always kind of stuck out as kind of this Western guy. And, uh, and it's just, I mean, a huge filmography, obviously not all Westerns, but my brain always goes to Westerns with him. And I think part of it is his voice. And I feel, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I feel like his voice was part of the inspiration for, uh, I don't know if you remember this from, um, uh, who framed Roger Rabbit, but when Eddie Valiant pulls out the cartoon gun and, and the bullets start talking to him and one of them sounds a lot like, like Andy Devine, like <laughs> Andy Valiant. It's, I, I totally feel like they pulled an Andy Devine, like uh, persona for That's that. That's amazing. <laughs> I hadn't made that connection. I, it's been a long time since I've seen that movie. I, I feel like we j- should jump into crew and certainly William Wellman, who directed this. Yes, we should. What do you think by old Willie about old William Wellman? 81 credits to this guy's name. 81, Andy. A uh, heck of a career. Looking through his filmography, I, I see a number of things that I've seen, a number of things that I've always wanted to see. Uh, he, he's a guy who's been around uh, quite a bit in the industry. And uh, certainly is a guy who is kind of uh, central to a lot of elements uh, of it because, I mean, he directed Wings, the 1927 Mm -hmm. film that was the first film to win an Academy Award for Best Picture in the very first uh, ceremony, the same year that that uh, that uh, Gaynor won the Best Actress Award. Um, And then uh, he'll win an award for this. And, And he's just one of those filmmakers who. Uh, I mean, he'd fought in, in World War One, and then he went on to just kind of have an amazing career in film, doing just a wide variety of things from the silent era all the way through uh, through the sound era with with, you know, just, you know, he was a filmmaker who made stuff all over the place, you know, the public enemy all the way to he did some Westerns and then he did things like this and uh, Viva Via, he did, and uh, the Oxbow Incident, and Buffalo Bill, and and the High and the Mighty, and uh, so it, yeah, I think um, what he brings to the table here. I, I mean, I already talked about a few shots that really stood out to me, but I think that's what stands out for me with William Wellman is he's a director who who knows how to work with his actors and knows how also to kind of construct the shots and the scenes in a very cinematic way that makes for a very engaging film. Yeah, I do too. And he, I think he plays the comedic moments uh, really nicely, uh, with the exception of the end that we already mentioned that I felt like was a little bit out of touch. The rest of the moments, like your dad walking into the light and uh, the way it explodes on his head after ducking so many times in other sequences, I think is just really funny. Like there's a lot of, of wonderful sort of little charming moments that I think he's able to... Um, you know, that I think he's able to work into this, this film. Not that, did I say the dad, the, the, the dad, yes. the hotel, <laughs> everybody who <laughs> runs a business is really just a dad to me. I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, I thought it was just really charming and, uh, and funny. And, uh, uh, you know, I think he just captures the innocence in the, particularly in the first half of the movie of, of Gaynor's rise or Vicky's rise so sweetly. Well, and I think uh, I think some of that uh, also I think we can attribute to the writing team, which is an interesting one. You have uh, as credited as the writers, you have Dorothy Parker, Alan Campbell and Robert Carson from a story by William Wellman and Robert Carson. And then you have a whole bunch of uncredited writers, which is another interesting group. David O. Selznick, Ben Hecht, Ring Lardner Jr., John Lee Mahan, Bud Schulberg, and then Adela Rogers St. John's, who had written the original one. It's it's an interesting group, and I think largely just the fact that at the top you have Dorothy Parker, Alan Campbell, Robert Carson. It's an interesting. Uh, it's I don't know. I, I know Dar- Dorothy Parker had been involved in uh, in film projects, but I don't think we've talked about one, have we? No, I, we have not. And I was blown away when I looked at her 
uh, her credits. She's not only was she involved in film projects, like she was involved in quite a few. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that showcase her work. And I haven't seen, uh, let's see, besides a star is born, uh, trade winds, sweethearts. Apparently she worked on, uh, some additional scenes and dialogue for the little foxes, uh, which we have talked about. Right. I, yes, I feel like we might have mentioned that. Yeah. Too. But, uh, but in terms of an entire film, I, I've got nothing. Well, I feel like Saboteur is one that I've uh, I've seen, um, and it's one from Hitchcock that I don't know if it struck me as something that would be like a Dorothy Parker vehicle. You know, uh, she was again one of three writers on that mm-hmm. one. Um, I don't know. It's just interesting to me that uh, it's you know. I, I guess I just don't think of her in these circles, but obviously she was in these circles. She was big in circles. <laughs> Dorothy yes. Parker. If anyone yeah, is, ones. <laughs> she's part of a lot of clubs. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it's, it, that's uh, to to the credit of the writing, though. That's a that's an excellent nod, and uh, it, it makes me want to. Well, a it makes me want to finally get back into that Hitchcock uh, series that we've been dancing with. Yeah, I know. One of these days. You mentioned the lighting, uh, some of the wonderful lighting and, uh, sequences before very dramatic lighting. We've got to talk about W. Howard Green, uh, man behind the camera. Yeah, he uh, he did a lot for color cinematography. And uh, I think that the Technicolor here clearly um, displays some of that work that he had been doing. Where I mean, there were the I don't know even even on the non Blu-ray version that I was watching. I mean, it really struck me when when uh, Vicky walks in and she's wearing that that green gown and she's got that vibrant red hair. I'm like, oh, this is why you watch Technicolor movies because it just it really pops. Just some just some beautiful beautiful stuff. The way that that he kind of constructed these scenes, but not just the color. Right? You're right. Just the way that he would light the scenes and everything. And I mean, he started. Started making, um, well, Warner Brothers uh, started making these Technicolor films back in the early 30s, and uh, it just it kind of became this thing for him. He was nominated for an Oscar seven times, and uh, for his color work, uh, he didn't uh, he didn't have nominations for his for his black and white films, and this because I, I you may recall, but this was that period in time where black and white cinematography and color cinematography were two separate nominations at the academy awards which is uh pretty interesting max steiner is the man behind the music andy i know uh, i know you love old max steiner ah yes good old max steiner a very it, it is a very 30s score the music that we have here um but it fits it always worked for me you know it never took me out of it um an interesting note though i did see that there actually is a song a Star is Born that uh, I never heard in the film. So it's interesting <laughs> that, uh, that uh, you know, this film or this song exists. It's called A Star is Born, performed by Buddy Clark and the uh, Eddie, how do you say it? Eddie Duchesne. Eddie Duchesne. Uh, the orchestra. So it's weird that we don't have a memory of it. Yeah. Well, Occasionally I'll hear the theme, but how did we miss it? I don't know. Well, I, I think. It's one of those things where we didn't realize the theme existed. I think if we probably watched yeah, the movie again, it. now that we know the tune, we probably go, oh, there it is. It's in this particular scene. But uh, we'll have to put the link for that in the show notes so people can go, oh, I see. This is interesting. Uh, did you catch that John Barrymore was originally cast as Norman Maine and that it, it it's rumored that the character of Norman Maine is actually based on Barrymore? I didn't see that. And John Gilbert and John Bowers. I didn't see that. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's it's one of those things where I think that this this story, I mean, it had because of the nature of kind of some of the real life inspirations and stuff, I, I think there were some people who likely had been uh asked to be a part of it and and might have just turned it down because of the nature of you know, because I mean some people said there was this sense that it was based on the relationship between or the marriage between Barbara Stanwyck and Frank Fay. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, we already mentioned some of the other people um, that might have been uh, uh, kind of inspired for the earlier version. Plus, John Bowers was this other character who had a suicide by drowning. 
And um, so, yeah, I mean, who knows? I'm I'm always curious, like, especially with, with older films like these, like, what are the stories that led to people like Barrymore? Was he ever involved, but he turned it down because of these things? Or I don't know. I'm, I'm very yeah. curious. Yeah. Uh, the, the funeral scene, which was inspired supposedly by Irving Thalberg's uh, funeral, which was mayhem. Oh, OK. I didn't know that. Yeah. How to do it award season, Andrew. Uh, this was a uh, it's a popular film. This is actually going to be fun to talk about with just all of these films and how um, uh, how they've kind of sat in the world of awards and everything, because they've all been big award nominees. This film had three wins, seven other nominations at the uh, 1938 Academy Awards. Uh, it won. We already mentioned W. Howard Green. He won for the color photography of this film. It was a plaque at the time. They hadn't quite established this award yet. Um, the award was recommended by a committee of leading cinematographers after viewing all the color pictures made during the year. <laughs> Sounds like fun time. All the color pictures. <laughs> well, and this is another interesting thing. So we already talked about the writing. Well, this one for best writing original story, which went to William A. Wellman and Robert Carson, not the writers who wrote the screenplay. I, yeah, I don't fully understand why, but it it did lose uh, the actual award for um, best screenplay. And it's just one of those weird things. Um, but it lost to The Life of Emil Zola, which is the film that that won that year. The um, the other awards, Frederick March was nominated for best actor in a leading role, but he lost to Spencer Tracy for Captain's Courageous. Um, we had Janet Gaynor nominated, but she lost to Louise Rayner for The Good Earth, who was uh, uh, the first actress and first performer to win consecutive awards for lead roles, actually. So a little interesting little bit of Hollywood history there. Uh, Eric Stacey was nominated for Best Assistant Director, another interesting award that they offered at the time. Um, but Robert D. Webb won for In Old Chicago. Uh, we uh, had William Wellman nominated for Best Director, but Leo McCary won for The Awful Truth. And uh, the best picture, A Star is Born, um, lost to The Life of Emil Zola. And um, uh, then other than the Oscars, it, uh, it won at the National Board of Review as one of the top 10 films. So it's, uh, it, again, it was an era where there weren't a lot of different awards, but those ones that were there were the big ones. Did it live up to um, it, its award hall at the box office? I mean, it seems like these are some big names. The movie had a budget of, uh, you know, weirdly, this, uh, like, I feel like I have a very specific budget amount for this. $1,173,639. <laughs> wow. I don't know why they gave me such a specific amount for the budget, but that's what I have. And that's about $19.6 million in today's dollars. The movie was released April 20th, 1937, um, and this was a period where, again, there weren't that many movies coming out, so it didn't really have any competition directly the same day, but a few days later, The Woman I Love was released, so uh, it was one of those where movies were released every few days, and it was kind of a very different era from what it is today. But uh, the movie uh, was a success at the box office. It's it's tricky with these numbers, though. It's kind of hard to guess exactly how much it made. What I could find is that it made over two million. That's all I found. <laughs> so I just plugged two million in and just figured we'd go with that. Um, that's about thirty three point four million in today's dollars, and that lands the film. You know, it gave it a profit of about one hundred twenty four thousand her finished in it so it's a, you know it's a successful story successful enough for them to want to revisit it uh, down the road well andy this is a, a nice way to kick off this series uh, and I, I think it's probably time to see where this one uh, hits as we rank it yes let's do it head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel and you'll see the list of all of the films that we have talked about on this show and how they stack up against one another if you click on flick chart in the show notes it'll take you straight to this film over on flick chart where you can add it to your own list and see how it stacks up against ours first up we have a star is born or rocky three i'm gonna say a star is born hey i'll give you a star is born a star is born or fargo absolutely fargo, fargo. a star is born or mother 
Um, I'm say mother. Mother, yeah, absolutely. Oh, Bong Joon Ho. Uh, Star is Born or Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd. A Star is Born or High Noon. High Noon. Yeah, I'll say High Noon. A Star is Born or Mad Max. Mad Max. Mad Max. This is too easy. <laughs> a Star is Born or Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh Brother. Oh Brother, indeed. A Star is Born or Numi, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Girl with the dragon tattoo. I will say the same thing. A Star is Born or The Lion in Winter. Mm, say okay. The Lion in Winter. Now it's, yeah, uh, Lion in Winter. Absolutely. That was a little bit of a trickier little, one for you, A little tricky, though. yeah. Well, that came almost right down to the middle. A Star is Born landed at 198. 198 out of 395. I'm, at, I'm actually surprised at, at where that... I guess I shouldn't be surprised given where that ended on my own chart. How did it do on yours? It landed at 1672 out of 4,112, which That's is a about a 59%. Higher. 59%. Uh, mine, mine came in right at 639 out of 1062, which is a 40%. If I go by the algorithm for uh, letterbox.com slash the next reel, that should be a two star, uh, which feels pretty good to me, if, if not a little bit conservative. I may be persuaded to two and a half stars, but, <laughs> but uh, right, it, it's feeling pretty good at two stars. Wow. Really? I enjoyed it. I mean, I enjoyed the movie. That's why I feel like it's right down the middle for me. The things that it does really well, um, you know, are, are balanced out by the fact that I just I, I sort of feel like the uh, the the tone of the 1930s just didn't sit with me as well with this particular story. What the movie did for me is it really made me look forward to the next version. I think I'm going to be successively looking forward to the next version of this film. More and more uh, until we get to um, the current. Well, I'm at a three star and a like. Uh, I, I think that almost all the way through, everything is working for me. I think it's only um, just some of that family element and, and the way that Granny comes yeah. back in that kind of uh, brought it down. But I loved these performances. I thought that uh, Gaynor and March just had uh, just everything right they just did, were wonderful. And I think that uh, March found a beautiful way to portray this character that made me really connect to him. And when he walks into the ocean, I mean, my heart just broke. It was really, really touching and powerful. And um, I, I'm so. going to say something that you don't hear often on the Internet. Uh, I've changed my mind. I think you're <laughs> you're absolutely right. Uh, you're absolutely right. I'm going to go with you. Uh, three stars and a like. I feel wow. Look at that. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely. I'm way too conservative on that. Two star. I look at the other films that are reserved. Movie two thousand one. Did you want to talk about that one again? While I'm on a roll, I haven't seen it. New phone. Who's this? (laughs) Dang it! (laughs) (laughs) All right, that's good. Three stars. Three stars and the like. Uh, (laughs) I guess we we don't have to say it, but where do we go from here? Yeah, right. Uh, This will be. uh, It'll be fun. We're going to be jumping to. Uh, an interesting and troubled uh, remake that's going to be interesting to look at. I haven't seen this one. This is the 1954 film that George Cukor directed with Judy Garland and James Mason. And uh, that will be uh, it will be an interesting one to to look at. And I I'm going to have to check and see because I feel like that one uh, I, they they re they released it in its original release it was just over three hours and then they chopped out for the issue the main run uh, like a half hour out of the film or an hour or something and i just heard there were a lot of issues with that and then i think they restored it actually um but i don't know i don't know when the restoration happened and so i'm actually very curious what version uh, in 1983 is when they restored it, and Letterbox restoration in 2000. So I'd like to think that the uh, the the disc that I've picked up from the library is a restored version. I'm going to have to check and see what the length is, though. Well, I I, I look forward to it. for me. It's going to be the iTunes uh, version. The um, and all of them are there. I I need to check the length on that too. It's the one I already have. So the 176 minute version is the version to look for apparently 176 in a row <laughs> subsequent minutes god indeed is yes, really indeed. Does this story does it really need <laughs> all, all of those minutes can't we do that a little bit more efficiently i guess we'll, oh. we'll i guess we'll have to wait and see 
uh, when we get to the end of that one if uh, if we felt it was warranted or not. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Well, it. that's actually what what I have. I have. That's what the um, the iTunes version is. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. So you're all set. That's good. I'm all set. Well, folks, if you want to hear more of us, but you can't wait until next week's show, check out our other show, The Marvel Movie Minute. We're talking about the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. And right now we're working our way through 2008's Iron Man. You can support that show and all of our shows over on thenextreel.com slash Patreon. And you can get access to our exclusive members-only weekend show, The Saturday Matinee. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon sometimes do it. Sometimes do it. <laughs> there, you know, this is uh, there's controversy as there always is. You want to talk about this uh, remake thing or the restoration? The, thing? You mean the restoration? Yeah. Well, it's just you know people get all uppity about the restorations, and apparently there's a UCLA restoration that uh, apparently Kino Lorber did not use. And and some of the people over on Amazon uh, comments are up in arms that the Kino Lorber version is not the pristine UCLA restored print. And uh, who knows? I really have no idea. I, I think you and I both know that if you really want to start an industry-wide uprising to really change the way people think about a certain subject, you start that in the Amazon comment thread. Oh, absolutely. This is where all great changes in society are coming. They're in the right place. Mm -hmm, they are. Absolutely. Right. What, what do you know. why, why don't you start? Oh, well, mine is, uh, you know, it's, it's opinionated and it's more of a teaser, something for us to look forward to, Andy. That's why I bring this. This is from Michael Wilkins Sr. And he says this is a one star. It's uh, a star is born. The first of three. Now four. Uh, he says, I couldn't get into this movie. The only really great remake was with Judy Garland. I wouldn't waste my time on the other two. The only really great remake was with Judy Garland. We shall see, Michael Wilkins. We, <laughs> yes, we shall, shall see. Well, I've got a two star from Mr. Old Man. And I, uh, I feel like it should be Mr. Grumpy Old Man, who says, not great. More proof that Hollywood is and always has been enamored with itself. Whenever they can't think of anything else to write about, which is almost always, they write about themselves. Frankly, it's a boring pick. Oh, so there you go. Grumpy yeah. old man, indeed. Mr. Old Man. Don't yeah, let the old man grumpy. in. Don't ever let the old man in. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great movies, so many great conversations. But it's a lot of work. Producing this show week after week does require a lot behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. We had some great films in Season 8 that started their lives as books or plays, and you can find all of them on our Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. That's the site where listeners can find links to purchase all the source material behind the adapted films we covered from season one up through our current season. For part of season eight, we had a series celebrating the 50th anniversary of films from 1968. We talked about 2001 and 2010 for our Odyssey series, both adapted from Arthur C. Clarke's novels. Man, the second one was so much better than the first, right? Don't you even get me started. <sighs> Need I bring up Under the Cherry Moon again? Yes, also so much better. <laughs> wait, wait, no, that's not what I... <sighs> Planet of the Apes kicked off its series based on the novel by Pierre Boulet. We covered Danger Diabolic and The Detective, adapted from novels for our 1968 crime films. Wait, wasn't that The Detective the prequel to Die Hard? They were both written by Roderick Thorpe, and yes, it's the same character in the books. I can't believe they even asked Sinatra if he'd be in Die Hard. That would have been yeah. weird. <laughs> Uh, Once Upon a Time in America was part of our Leone Once Upon a Time trilogy, adapted from Harry Gray's novel. And we looked at 1968 Best Picture nominees The Lion in Winter, Rachel Rachel, Romeo and Juliet, and Oliver! 
We also had an Ingrid Bergman series with adaptations like Spellbound, For Whom the Bell Tolls, Murder on the Orient Express, and Gaslight. We haven't talked about Gaslight. Stop gaslighting me! <laughs> Dive deeper into these books and more adapted films at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the podcast. Get the full list of adaptations that we've covered on all the Next Real family of podcasts and start your next read today at thenextreel.com slash originals. <laughs>